This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today we got a uh, walk-in freezer. Uh, they're complaining that it's not working properly. All the food in here is thawed. So, nice and soft, so that's a problem. Um, I got no display on the QRC board. This is a QRC equipped unit. Uh, no signs of power. I went into the breaker room. Everything seems to be on in there. So the next step, this unit, this evaporator coil is powered from the roof. So we're gonna jump on the roof. And I'm walking up to the unit and the disconnect switch is off. That's alarming. No other, I mean, nobody else should be on this roof and we haven't been up here, but, but, look at this. We just had some rain. Although, no, I don't know, maybe that stuff looks new. Yeah, maybe, maybe a roofer was up here hatching something. I don't know, that's interesting. We're not gonna just turn a disconnect switch on. We don't know why. That's very interesting. Ironically, the customer says this thing's been off for what they think to be two days. Which sounds kind of crazy because it's a walk-in freezer and it's still relatively cold in there. It's probably like 50 degrees. All right, well, we're gonna jump into it. We don't just flip disconnects on. We're gonna figure out why someone maybe shut it off. We assume that someone shut it off to assume the worst. All right, so we're gonna start by taking all the covers off and then uh, checking for anything short of the ground. Fan motors are stuck. Just anything for, we're looking for a reason why someone would have shut this off. Okay, we're not gonna waste too much time. Very quickly, we're gonna check for line voltage coming to the unit. Gonna check from phase to phase, line one to line two. 207, 208, one to three, 208, two to three, 208, okay? Next thing we're gonna do, disconnect switches off. We're gonna verify that the disconnect is working. Making sure that it's actually disengaging. Checking to ground. On the load side, nothing. So we're gonna do a, a continuity test, see if we have any tone or resistance to ground. Okay. Find a good ground. Testing on the load side. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We're gonna test the fuses now. Fuse three is good. Fuse two is good. Fuse one is good. So no direct shorts to ground. I don't see any reason as of yet why I can't turn this guy on. We're gonna double check the condenser fan motors real quick. Make sure that they spin and that nobody shut them off because they were hitting anything. Nothing. I see no reason why I can't turn this unit on at this moment. So we're gonna go ahead and put this disconnect cover back on. Okay. And turn it on. And it turned right on. Very interesting. We're gonna watch the unit operate. We'll run downstairs, see what it's looking like. My evaporator fan motors are running and my smart controller or the QRC board, or you can call it a beacon board too. This isn't a full beacon system, but anyways, it's just the QRC, it's the dumbed down version. But um, it basically doesn't have communication with the roof. But uh, it says off, so it's, a, it's kind of a time delay. And it says it's 35 degrees in the box right now. So it should say COO for cool here in just a minute. This is very peculiar. I talked to the manager and he said nobody was on the roof. There we go, now we have a delay. And I just heard refrigeration kick in, so. I'm intrigued that the fans are running though. I would think that the fans wouldn't be running yet, but this smart board's smarter than I, so. Our unit is running. It's been running for about 15 minutes. Um, I don't know what the box temp is as of yet. We do have, every once in a while, the sight glass will flash. Every once in a while it flashes and then it clears up. And I did notice that there's a little bit of oil back here. A little bit of oil just on the ground. So we may have a small leak at a Schrader cap. Again, it could just, you know, I don't think this has anything to do with why the disconnect switch was off. I think that someone shut it off. Why, I don't know. Management doesn't know. So as always, big picture. 
Um, I'm gonna investigate, clear up that sight glass if I need to. As I always say, you really gotta use your senses. So I noticed that there looked like some oil residue right in this area of that liquid service valve right there. And look right here, this is the inside of the panel right in that area when I took this off. So there's like a oil stain, something or other right there too. So always gotta pay attention and use your senses. Okay, I've shown this before, but I'll show it again. Charging with smart probes. I have a service fitting on here. I use a hose with a uh, low loss fitting on one side and then a ball valve on the other. Open up the tank, invert it so we get liquid. Purge, so you get vapor or liquids. Okay, it's purged. And then what I'm gonna do when I'm turning it on, I'm gonna crack it ever so slightly so that way no air gets in there. And now we're off and we meter in by the ball valve. Just add refrigerant until our sight glass clears up. So like I had said before, the sight glass is going from clear to flashing. So it might not be that low. And in fact, it's probably a smart idea to pump it down first and then test to see the liquid level to see how short it is. I'm sure it is because if it's flashing when the head pressure control valve is not bypassing, now it's starting to flash right now. So I will add a little bit. And I can see my suction pressure on my tablet right here. So one of the difficult things about this unit is, is that since it's a microchannel coil, microchannel condenser, um, the winter charge or the, uh, the extra refrigerant needed for the head pressure control valve to properly flood the condenser uh, is a little bit harder to determine. So there is manufacturer's data uh, that'll tell you it's it's literally no more than a pound too compared to a tube and fin condenser where you can sometimes add multiple pounds on a condenser this size I bet you the refrigerant charge needed to flood the condenser is like half a pound or something there's some tech data you can pull up from the manufacturer and it shows you but um my you know in the field the best way for like I approach it right now the head pressure control valve is not bypassing um, Every once in a while it's flashing. The easiest way for me to do is, is since I marked the liquid level, just check the liquid level and fill it to that. Be very careful too, because you don't want to overcharge a micro channel. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pump it down at the receiver. So when you front seat this king valve on this receiver, you shut off the flow going to this dryer. So we wouldn't be able to see the system head pressure uh, to know if the system's head pressure was going too high while we're pumping it down. So if I was connected here, this would go down as the suction pressure would go down. And eventually this pressure at this port and the suction pressure would be the same because the king valve is shutting off the flow. So by connecting on the king valve Schrader port, I now see the system pressure while it's pumping down so I can know if there's a problem. The unit has a packing, so we're gonna loosen the packing. Just a little bit. Just enough to save the seal from getting damaged. common for the packing to leak so I tightened it while it's pumping down because it was kind of leaking a little bit out but now it's stopped so we're gonna wait for the system to fully pump down then we're gonna uh, warm up the receiver with the heat producing device I've told you guys a million times use a heat producing device that doesn't exceed the soft plug temperature on the receiver which is usually on this particular one around 400 degrees there's usually sometimes there's a mechanical seal this one right here has a, uh, a dimple in the top of the receiver. Right up here in the top of the receiver, there's a dimple, that is the soft plug. And I doubt you guys can see it, but right in front of it, it's stamped 430 degrees. So we're gonna use a heat producing device. We're gonna pass it up and down the receiver a couple times once it's pumped down. Again, not getting it too hot, being very careful. Um, and then we're gonna check the liquid level. You can feel it with your fingers. Okay, so we can clearly see with the thermal imaging camera that the liquid level is below the three quarter mark. So it feels cool, cool, cool. It gets warm right here. Here's our liquid level at this moment right here. And I can feel it, it's cool, and then it starts to get warm right here and then you could clearly see it with the thermal imaging camera too. So we are definitely low on charge. So we're gonna go ahead and top off that charge and then I bet you anything we have a leak right around this valve right here. So I'm just very carefully adding the charge. 
when the unit turned on, I'm just adding it real quick, the unit's still pumped down. Being very careful not to overload the compressor with liquid refrigerant. Just going nice and slow. Okay, we should probably let it pump down and check the liquid level again. We're pumped at three quarters of the receiver now. Okay, my liquid level is now here. Right there, which is right where my original mark was that I put when I installed this equipment. So it's important that we, you know, I'm not always perfect, but in this one, I marked the liquid level with a paint marker that wouldn't fade off. So that way, you know, make my job easier now. Because here's the thing, if I didn't mark it, who's to say if I filled it up to the three quarter mark from the beginning? Maybe I just weighed in, you know, maybe I calculated the charge and put in the factory calculation. The factory calculation probably isn't gonna be three quarters of the receiver, maybe it is, we don't know. Sometimes on some systems, especially tube and fin condensers, um, you know, with the winter charge, the receivers can be oversized and stuff. So you might only have, you know, half a receiver when it's got the proper flooded charge in it. So let's say that I didn't want to put the maximum amount. Maybe I calculated it, okay? But still, if I marked it, then I would know from that point forward every time that that liquid level should be there when it's pumped down. You get where I'm going with that? It's all about, you know, a proper commissioning. I should have shown you guys what I already did, but I leak checked with the cap on and I wasn't getting anything. The unit had an O-ring because the O-ring is still stuck to the valve. And earlier guys, I said liquid line, that's a discharge line valve. And that's there to isolate the compressor essentially. So you can do a compressor change technically without having to remove all the refrigerant from the system. So anyways, but check valve right there. And let's see, every once in a while, we get a spit of a leak. So it looks like maybe a bad Schrader. So guys, Schraders, they always leak, right? But a cap doesn't solve it. A cap isn't gonna make it not leak, all right? It'll, it'll take time and it'll leak slower, but if there's a leak in Schrader, it's gonna leak through a cap eventually, even if it has an O-ring. So now we're gonna leak check the top of this too and open that up to see if the top is leaking because those sometimes will do that. I pulled off the cap and it looks like there might be oil in there, so I bet you it's leaking out the top too. No? Nope, not picking up a leak. So, sometimes my eyes can fool me, but no, nothing there, but let's go back to the Schrader. And it picks it up at the Schrader. So I can throw in a new Schrader right now, that's not a big deal. That could be an easy one, and then we'll be done with this, because nothing up here. Good stuff, all right, we'll fix it real quick. All right, I even had my core removal tool, a new Schrader, all in my bag, so. All right, first off, this is really easy. Put the core removal tool on. It's kind of going on a little tight. You turn it until you feel it clicking. That's when it's loose. You hope that it comes out. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It doesn't look like it came out. I don't know why this thing's so tight. Maybe it needs to be greased or something. I went and grabbed a little nylog, put it right here. It was just dry, just needed some lubrication. Now the question is, how do I get this silly thing out? Sometimes they're a pain, especially since it's on the discharge line. I find it much more difficult to get Schraders out of discharge lines, especially once they get really close to the compressor. It usually melts the gasket, messes them up. But yeah, so this is nice and good now. We'll try one more time. That went on much easier. Look like it's damaged, but whatever. Got a new one. Yeah. Cool. Schrader's in. Torque it down with a torque wrench. Cool. Good to go. No more leaks. All right, I am not gonna watch this box come all the way down to temperature. 
again remember we just found the disconnect switch off and the manager and none of the management staff turned it off so we don't know who was up on the roof a roofer who knows we don't know it's running everything else is looking good um i went ahead and gave the condenser a quick little brush and no way did it i didn't wash it or anything like that it was just dirty up in the top so just brushed it off real quick everything else is looking good so i'm gonna put this unit together weighing the cylinder we're gonna call this 14 pounds so originally weighed 18 so we used four pounds so it's down to about 17 degrees and working we are getting an error code a1 but that's just an alarm for high room temp so yeah point something out too i saw this disconnect switch off nobody can really get up here their roof hatch is really inaccessible it's right here but to get up this roof hatch you have to go through the customers it's it's a nightmare it's like in, in a hallway by the restrooms it's it's not something that you know like a, a restaurant cook can go and do if he was trying to sabotage the restaurant or something so coming up their roof hatch really isn't something that's going to happen unless it's a manager you know someone's going to know that's happening um so I'm just kind of walking around just wondering, you know, I don't see any fresh tagging on the roof. So I don't think anybody's been up here vandalizing anything. There's no other disconnect switches off. I do see this, which is suspect. This, uh, it's looks like roof sealer, but I don't see any new roof sealer around here, really. I mean, I see some new white stuff, but it's all dirty, but I do see that. Uh, looks like someone picked up some belt trash, but that's old, that's not new and some belts someone's not doing their job but i'll take those down with me but i'm just looking around is there anything else that's messed up you know i don't see any other acs that are off i checked them all so again i never found why the disconnect switch was off but i don't always just assume someone shut it off to vandalize or to be a punk i'm looking at it thinking why would someone shut it off what purpose would someone have to come on the roof trying to investigate and figure it out now if i saw fresh tagging on the roof I would attribute it with that, someone just being a punk, right? But I don't see that. You know, it's possible that someone could have gotten on this roof from other ways. You can get on top of their walk-in and then it's a six foot jump up here. I mean, you know, that I'm never gonna find out, but I did my due diligence just to see like, hey, is there anything obvious that someone's been up here? And I don't see anything. This was the perfect example. This is nothing super technical. This is a simple walk-in freezer. And I could have been in and out of there in 20 minutes the box probably would have worked okay. Maybe the refrigerant charge wouldn't have been a huge issue. Maybe it's not cold enough for the head pressure control valve to bypass at this time. You know, they probably would have been okay. But looking at the big picture, I was thorough and I went through everything and I found more problems than just a simple failed disconnect switch. Very important though, was that I was totally upfront with the customer. I didn't go up there and say, oh, it was low on charge. That was your problem. I went to them and I said, look, when I walked up to it, this unit's disconnect switch was off. Why? I have no idea. But because I don't just turn disconnect switches on, I went through everything else and I found that it was actually low on charge too. So the customer was involved in my decision-making process. They were part of the loop the entire time. I was not trying to defraud them or cheat them in any way. I was upfront, honest, and fair. I looked at the big picture. I gave them a proper diagnosis, and then I said, and I found these other things wrong too. So let me look into these. Let me solve this problem before it becomes a problem later on down the line, okay? And you guys saw the results, okay? We got the unit up and operating as best as it could. Everything was good, okay? Big picture diagnosis. I can't stress that one enough. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. I do live streams Monday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time, work permitting, meaning that if I can get off work in time, I go live and I answer questions. Um, you guys, I don't do a lot of email and Facebook and YouTube comment replies during the week. I try to address them Mondays just to give myself some sanity because these videos can be taxing on you, trying to keep up with the comments and looking at the numbers. So I've been trying to find a, a life balance and paying more attention to my family and trying to dedicate certain amounts of time to answering these video questions and different things. So that's the whole point of the live streams, guys, is to address the, the more common questions and then I'll, I'll answer emails, you know, as I see it fit, all right? But I really appreciate your guys' support. It is really awesome. Do me a favor, help me out. Share these videos. If you know someone that you think they could help, share them, please. That helps me grow as a channel, helps me grow as a creator, 
gets the word out about the message that I'm trying to spread. And I'm not going to lie. It helps me financially too. Okay. Um, but I'd really appreciate the support if you guys could. All right. Just share these videos. That's all I ask. Okay. Really, really appreciate it. Any questions you guys have, feel free to send them to me at HVACIvideos at gmail.com. Leave a comment on this, leave a comment on Facebook, you know, anywhere. I'll try to get to them. Come to the live stream, ask the questions in the comments section. Okay. I always share affiliate links in the video show notes about the tools that I use because that's one of the more common questions I get is, is where did you get that tool? Do you have a link for the tool? So I always share affiliate links. Those also help me to support the channel financially when you guys click on my affiliate links. It's awesome when you guys do. I really appreciate it. Okay. We will catch you guys on the next one.